Hey everyone, we are just about to get started with our main call uh, here in a minute. My name is Erin, I'm with Bay Area News Group. Wanted to just go over a few housekeeping notes with everyone. Um, everyone is gonna be on mute, so if you do have a question, please go ahead and use that Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. Any other um, comments, please go ahead and use that chat feature. We would love to hear from you. Um, and like I said, we're gonna get started here in a minute. Uh, we also wanted to kind of promote our third episode of our sports series. It's going to be our final one. Uh, it is the episode three about the NFL. It'll be next week, August 6th at 10 a.m. So please go ahead and register for that. You do have to register separately. Um, so please make sure you do that. And I think we're, we're ready to get started. Um, I'm so happy to introduce to you Tom Moore. He's our executive sports editor actually from Southern California News Group. We are doing this, uh, you know, California wide. So we have some of our, our journalists from the Bay Area News Group, some journalists from Southern California News Group. So we kind of get a, a holistic look at California basketball. And Tom, please go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, I'm excited about this conversation. Uh, thanks uh, to all the writers that have joined. Um, uh, my name is Tom Moore. I'm the sports editor at the uh, Southern California News Group. So that includes uh, the Orange County Register, the LA Daily News, uh, the Riverside Press Enterprise, among others. Um, and uh, I'm a huge basketball fan, and I've never seen anything quite like the run-up to um, this season, um, you know, with the uh, pursuit of Kawhi Leonard, um, all that went into the free agency, uh, the Lakers and Clippers both uh, expecting to contend. Um, and then, you know, um, we had Kobe Bryant's death and a pandemic and, um, uh, you know, all the work that's, that's uh, taken place to reach this, this moment where we're going to return to basketball and a Lakers-Clippers um, matchup tonight. Um, so there's a ton to talk about. I think we're, we're going to run out of time pretty quick. Um, but I want to introduce uh, the writers here. We've got Kyle Goon inside the NBA bubble. Um, been doing great work from there. Uh, he covers the Lakers. We've got Miriam Swanson, uh, who covers the Clippers and pitches in on Lakers coverage for us all the time. Uh, and she also covers the WNBA and the Sparks for us. And we've got Wes Goldberg. He's the um, uh, Warriors beat writer for the Mercury News. And we've got Dieter Kurtenbach. Uh, if I said that right, I think I did. Um, you nailed columnist, it. columnist for the Bay Area News Group. Um, but I want to just go around the room a little bit and uh, do some introductions. So Kyle, we'll start with you. Yeah, what's there to say? Uh, uh, the, I'm in Florida. I've been covering the last two the Lakers the last two years, which have to count for the, the craziest uh, last two years of the Lakers franchise, perhaps. I think that's like uh, five years in real time now. Yeah, it's it's like dog years or something. Uh, I you know this time a year ago I thought uh, Magic resigning on the last day of the season and from the media would be the craziest thing I ever saw. So uh, you know, here we are. Yeah, but uh, I am in Orlando. I'm going to be watching Lakers Clippers tonight live. Uh, Miriam, let's go to you. Thanks, Kyle. Sure. Hey all, um, Miriam. I, I hope it doesn't get any crazier, Kyle. I don't think we can take it. Um, yeah, we, I think we've reached peak crazy, yeah. but it, it could. Let's hope. Every time you think that, it's it it uh, changes in 2020. No doubt, no doubt. Um, yeah. So I uh, I'm, I've been with SENG for a little less than Kyle, but this is my second year covering the NBA. Um, graduated from college, and the goal was to cover. Or the dream was to cover the NBA and the WNBA, and somehow. After a roundabout trip through covering everything from Oscar winners and city council meetings to golf and action sports, uh, I finally get to do it. So that's me. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, Wes, let's, uh, let's give you a minute to introduce yourself. Sure. Well, where Kyle is, he's been in Florida for a couple of weeks. I was in Florida for 22 years, born and raised in South Florida. So I know, I, I don't, maybe I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I have a general sense. Um, and uh, I moved out here about six years ago after I graduated from UCF. And uh, this is my first year on the Warriors beat for the Mercury News. And uh, I'm not really sure if it counts as a completed season for me, but um, it, was, it was crazy nonetheless. And, and so, um, yeah. Everything, everything that's happened to the Warriors is Wes's fault, is what he's trying that's to right. say. That's what I've been saying <laughs> the, the entire one, year. One element that uh, People tell me different. that all the time. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 It wasn't that new stadium or anything or all those injuries. It was Wes Goldberg. The entire team yeah. took a poll and said, let's, let's tank for Wes. Blame um, me, not Aaron Baines. <laughs> um, Dieter, since you have the floor, uh, how Sorry. about introducing yourself? Uh, hi, Dieter Kurtenbach. I'm the sports columnist at the Bay Area News Group, which means that uh, I cover everything. But over the last couple of years, that means that I more or less just cover the Warriors uh, because they had one hell of a run. And uh, luckily, Wes has filled me in on how bad things were this year because I, I did not go to Chase Center as often as I went to Oracle Arena in the last couple of years. Um, this is, uh, what heck, my fifth year uh with the with the Warriors, maybe four and a half if we're we're using the West Goldberg logic. Uh, and yeah, we've we've just seen some some crazy things. Five straight finals runs, and now uh, whatever the hell this is. And while you know Kyle spending time in Florida and West spent twenty two years, uh, I only did three and a half in in South Florida. So um, yeah, I, I guess I'm I guess I'm beaten on all counts there. Thanks, Dieter. Um... So we'll, let's start talking about uh, tonight's game a little bit. Um, first of all, I want to apologize. There's a, there's a door right here behind me. And my um, nine-year-old daughter, uh, she's asleep right now, but I think she's going to wake up and her hair is going to be a big mess. And she may walk right through this door to, to get her Legos. So if that happens, um, uh, do not be surprised. Um, Kyle, uh, tell us what, what, what you're thinking about tonight and and what we might expect there have been three versions of lakers clippers all pretty memorable uh, from opening day to uh christmas day um to the lakers victory when, when both teams were fairly close to full strength um what are you expecting tonight out of this matchup um i can tell you one thing with certainty that will not happen is that Kawhi leonard will not get booed in his own arena uh, for his own home game so in that sense, the Clippers are already coming out to a strong start. Um, I really wonder what this game will mean because every Lakers-Clippers game has been like a measuring stick, right? It's been, okay, like here are these stars, here are these, um, you know, veteran teams. Um, what's, like, where do they stack up? We really think these two teams are going to be in the Western Conference Finals. I still feel that way now. Um, I don't know if this game is going to be the measuring stick that some of the other ones have been at Christmas. Uh, when the Clippers prevailed back in March, uh, when the Lakers finally won one. Um, I, th I think it will be a little bit like the first one where there's going to be a little bit of growing pains. We see the rust that guys have. And frankly, I mean, we can't talk about this game without acknowledging how many guys the, the Clippers are probably going to be without. I mean, including Lou Williams, Montrez Harrell. And um, I, I suspect, even though he's questionable, Patrick Beverly, who was at shoot around today, but not literally shooting around today. Um, so it, it's just not the same team. Um, and the Clippers without Avery Bradley and Rajon Rondo are not quite the same either. And Lager, introducing yeah. Deion Waiters and J.R. Smith, which, I mean, listen, we thought we had the mean team last year. Um, this, is, this is a brand new uh, reconnecting of the mean team. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I wonder. I think it will just be that initial sort of out, coming out of the starting blocks, who's going a little bit faster. Miriam, what are, you, what are you looking for tonight, uh, especially Clippers-related, uh, as you watch? Um, well, I, I think it, in its own way, as, as Kyle sort of mentioned, this is very much um, a measuring stick. Just the, the measuring stick now is, you know, where are we at, at the start or the restart of everything? Um, but, yeah, I, I, the Clippers will not be the Clippers that, at, that, you know, they were when this ended. You know, they don't have um, – they would have, you know, their two du their superstar duo or their star reserves, uh, Trez and uh, Lou Williams and, and Pat Bev, as, as Kyle saw in, in person today in the bubble, um, was there, but not yet participating. Um, so that will obviously change the dynamic of the game. But um, I think I'm looking for how you know, Paul George has looked really good in the three scrimmages so far, but Kawhi hasn't looked so good. He shot horribly so far. Um, so we'll see if he can kind of, wake up and turn it on a little bit or or how he kind of you know goes into fi finds a rhythm going forward um also the, the clippers were without landry shamit and Ibiza zubats for most if not all of the scrimmages so they're working those guys in brand new too so we'll they, there's a lot of room for like there's a lot of work to do yet for the clippers so we'll see how they stack up yeah it's it's pretty interesting i'm just trying to like in my head 
try to figure out how this game is different from some of the scrimmages that have been happening as everybody gets back, right? Because it, 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 it is a measuring stick. It is a rivalry, but it's going to be the same kind of a floor and, and uh, no fans atmosphere and uh, missing pieces. And, and it'll, it should be interesting. Um, Wes, I, I assume you're wa- going to watch tonight and tune in and, and, you know, as a, um, you know, uh, without having a team in and having to, to work tonight uh, during that game, I guess, um, what, what, are, what are your thoughts going into that? Well, I'm just thankful to watch some quality, high quality yeah. basketball for the first time in months. Um, and that's a little bit of a knock on the Warriors, but it's also good to just have sports back too. Um, no, I'm looking for kind of what we were talking about. What, which one of these two groups um, can sort of establish an edge and how many, how many of their cards do they want to show to the other team? Like the Clippers with, with all the injuries that they have might not, they're not gonna be able to show all their cards, but what can the Lakers do? You know, they're going to be missing Rondo, of course, and he's going to be a part of that rotation, I suppose, going forward. And, but there's also the working in of the J.R. Smiths and Deion Waiters and stuff like that. But how much do they really want to show? Because what these coaches, Frank Vogel, Doc Rivers, had had so much time to do is go back on the film, watch those old games and, and try to figure out whatever edges they have. I would doubt that they would show those edges at any point. Um, we're already seeing some teams in the bubble opt not to um, take timeouts at the end of at, at the end of these scrimmages because they don't want to tip their hand to the to some of their uh, out of timeout yeah. plays and stuff and and so um, I think we'll see a little bit of there'll be a moment right there'll be a few minutes during this game where they really go at each other where the players just say screw it let's do this but it's not I think we're going to see less of that maybe, maybe from the coaches who could be a little bit bit a little bit more restrained yeah, I think, I mean, there's just so much learning both teams are, are going to be trying to do. And I agree with you that they, that they're they not going to tip anything that, that's going to matter later. Dieter, what are, are, are you writing off? What are you writing today? And, and are you, are I you might, just going to be guys done are, writing and to, just tuning in to watch this one? Yeah, if you guys are interested on the Oakland days now. Um, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> the thing, very specifically, the thing that I'm interested to see is if LeBron and Alex Caruso can get kind of some chemistry that I saw uh, develop this season back on track with Rondo out. Um, I think that's imperative for the Lakers. I, I, the big question for me regarding the Lakers is how are they going to handle Anthony Davis in, in crunch time moments and how often will he actually play center? Uh, they're still kind of the only team holding out this notion that Anthony Davis is a power forward. And I, I cannot imagine that that's the case or that they hold on to that belief deep into the playoffs. But as Wes alluded, as everyone's alluded to, like I don't think that the Lakers are going to show their hand too much. So I'm interested to see the Alex Caruso LeBron connection. Uh, LeBron has always seemed to have a, a pretty good connection with scrappy white point guards who can move off the ball. So uh, I saw it year after year with Cleveland and Matthew Della Vadova. Um, I think that Alex Caruso is a much better player than Matthew Della Vadova. So uh, that, that's something to, to definitely keep an eye on because chemistry is one of those things that you don't really hold back uh, in, in games that probably don't really matter all that much. Yeah, thanks, Dieter. Um, we'll come back to tonight, and and uh, but I wanted to take a moment to just talk a little bit about the team that is not playing, the, the Warriors, and you know just kind of um, Wes, get your take, uh, and then Dieter's on you know one an update on where Clay's at and um, uh, what you've seen in his his rehab. Um, and what are the key things you're looking at for for the off season for the Warriors? Well, as far as Clay goes, everything he's working out in Southern California right now, and everything seems to be good. He's been shooting around a lot. Um, he's really happy with where he's at in his rehab, so he's probably going to hit the ground running next year. Um, I think if there are any issues with Clay, it's just how he can move defensively, um, which you never really know until you're doing that in a game. Um, but as far as the shot. I mean, he's going to be able to shoot. So, you know, the splashes will still happen. Uh, Steph, same thing. There's, there seems to be no indication that the left hand is, is um, going to be a problem going forward. Uh, and then having those two guys back next year for the Warriors, that offense is going to be way better than it was this year. I think that goes without saying. Uh, they'll probably be a top 15 offense right out the gate. Uh, it's the defense where I have some concerns with the Warriors. 
Um, and I think it's where their concerns are. They need to take a huge step forward. And so I think that's the plan for this off season is what can they do um, with the top five pick with this trade exception that they have uh, where they'll be able to acquire a player who makes up to $17 million. They have a couple of other avenues to, to go about adding players. Those players they, they add, I think the number one box they need to check off is can you make this defense better than it was last year? Because if they can't, that, and they need to take like a dramatic leap from like worst in the league to at least above average, uh, like 15 or, or above. That's going to take a lot of new players and a lot of development from that team. Um, and so that's to me what I'm looking for. But it all starts uh, in a couple of weeks with the draft lottery in August. They have a good chance to get the number one pick, but moreover, they have, they're guaranteed to get a top five pick. I think there, it's, it's almost a 50% chance that they end up at five. Um, and so wherever that pick falls is going to really shape what, what they're able to do um this offseason because it's kind of a it's not the best NBA draft that we've had in a few years so you know the number one pick versus the fifth pick could be dramatically you know you can get a, a dramatically different player between one and five. Peter what are you keeping an eye on? Going off of what Wes was saying in terms of defense a big part of that is going to be Draymond Green just trying harder uh no real <laughs> nice way to put that uh uh he was surrounded by a bunch of uh guys who let's be real, weren't 16 game players, as he likes to call them. They were uh, 82 game guys, or maybe about 60 of those games were down in the NBA development G League. So uh, he did not engage in the way that you expect Draymond Green to engage. I imagine Steph and Clay coming back will have him elevate his game. We'll see how much he has in the tank. That's a big question. Uh, he put on a lot of hard miles over those championship runs. And then uh, going again off of what was saying, they're going to need to add a wing. They're going to need to add a guy who can slide slide in when Draymond goes to the center position in crunch time minutes of games that they're expecting to win, which the expectation is next year, they're going to try to win some games. That's a, it's a big goal, but they're going to go for it. Um, who can be a defensive first wing? Who can be a lockdown guy? Clay Thompson is going to try to go back to guarding the other team's point guards in lieu of Steph. Andrew Wiggins, who they brought in this past year, He's not that guy. He, they, he's, he's done better than I think the Warriors expected in terms of defensive ability, but he's no Andre Iguodala. Basically, they need to recreate Andre Iguodala, and they have Andre Iguodala's $17 million salary uh, exemption in which to do it and a draft pick. I wouldn't be shocked if they traded that draft pick, that top five pick, in, in conjunction or as a separate deal to, uh, to land a couple of NBA players because their championship window is right now and getting some 19 year old kid who out of a really bad draft if we're being honest, I don't know if that does anything to help them while Steph and Clay are still in their primes. Do you, do you guys either Wes or Dieter, are you, um, you have a couple names you think they might might target that fit fit that role you're talking about. If they this, if this they is this is this trade. is Wes's foray. Wes has yeah. got all the names. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually I push back a little bit on the even trading that pick because mm. I think the pick that might be is more apt to get traded is next year's pick coming from Minnesota. Mm. It's top three protected. We don't know what Minnesota is going to look like. You already have done the work for this draft. Um, and you're guaranteed to have it in the top five or next year, there's no way it can land in the top three if you're the Warriors because then it goes to Minnesota. And it could be the 12th pick, the 13th pick, instead of a guaranteed top five pick. You could trade that pick with the, the trade exception and go get a player. I think this team has done – this organization has done a lot of work on this draft. They've been preparing for a top five pick since basically December. Um, and so they sort of owe it to themselves to go ahead and just take a player and trust your scouting and trust your coaching staff to develop that player. And I look at guys who are wings to, to what Dieter was saying, guys who can walk in right away, make some shots, guard several different positions. I don't think center is an, is really an option for them in the top five. I don't think James Wiseman is a fit there, but if you look at a guy like Anthony Edwards, who's also at the top of the, a lot of boards, he makes a lot of sense for golden state, a guy who can, who's a ridiculous athlete, which the warriors quietly need. Like their best athlete is Andrew Wiggins. Their second best athlete is, I don't know, Marquise Chris. Yeah. Like they need, they need to add athleticism. Anthony Edwards is that athlete. Um, can guard several positions, can cut off the ball. Like I said, his catch and shoot numbers have been pretty good at Georgia. He's going from maybe the worst possible situation in Georgia, which was not leveraging his talents to a great situation hypothetically in Golden State. So he's just going to be like Anthony Edwards last day at Georgia versus his first day at Golden State. He's going to be a much better player. Yeah. Golden State and then I, the other guys that I like 
Tyrese Halliburton, Devin Vassell, Sadiq Bey. I mean, just all these wings who can guard several positions, make shots right away. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about this draft is a lot of people at the beginning of the year when Steph went down were saying, oh, this could be the Warriors. This could be their Tim Duncan draft where David Robinson goes down, they take Tim Duncan. I look at it more as like this could be their Kawhi Leonard draft where if we want to make the Spurs analogies over and over again, uh, where their championship infrastructure is already there. You have a core trio of veteran players who know what to do and have playoff and championship experience, but they're on the other side of 30. You need to add some youth and athleticism. That's what Kawhi did for the Spurs. He walked in, he was a 3 and D player right away and then developed into a future franchise building block. That's what the Warriors need with this pick. Get a guy who can get 20 minutes a night, not be a complete negative, make some shots, guard some people, and then, you know, years down the line when Steph is really out, then you can maybe develop that person into an a all-star type player. Well, Wes, uh, Kawhi Leonard was selected with the 15th overall pick in right. the 2011 draft. And uh, so I, believe, I believe what you uh, referred to in terms of they've put in a lot of work in this draft and they owe it to themselves is the sunk cost fallacy. So, uh, You're not wrong. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe they should not operate on that wavelength, though you're probably going to be correct, as, as you usually are. Um, no, thanks, guys. I, I, um, I think we should return to the teams that are currently playing. Um, but maybe before that, though, uh, I'd like to go around and ask each of you um, what your 2020 moment has been in, in such a strange year in how, you know, your work has cross paths with um you know all we're going through in in this year um and, and maybe just the most unusual or you know the thing that you know got your t attention and and most memorable in, in terms of um uh the, the moment we're living in right now um i'm gonna save kyle for last on this since he's down there in, in this unusual place but uh miriam what about you i mean there's so many and so many of it is, you know, we've collectively experienced it together, you know, as far as working from home and doing nothing but Zoom interviews and, and all, well, not all of us, Kyle's there in real life, but um, uh, the rest of us. Um, but I guess the moment early on um, when uh, that really kind of brought COVID to light was uh, when one of the Sparks players was one of the first, or was the first WMA player who uh, came down with coronavirus and um, Sydney Weiss had had a heck of a time getting she was playing in Spain where there was a huge outbreak happening before ours and then she had to hustle to get home before <laughs> while she could um, afraid that they wouldn't let her back in anymore and then she kept, you know went through a whole number of airports where screening there was no screening and she was stuck with a bunch of people and she sort of had some symptoms and just her adventure was was quite telling of what was coming um, and then she tried like heck to get tested and finally got tested tested positive um and she recovered and she's okay but but it just sort of made me realize that this is coming from everywhere and, and how we didn't have a handle on it at all um and uh so it was interesting to sort of tell her story a little bit at the beginning i remember that at, at that time too that that um you know, uh, the jazz had their, their outbreak sort of at, at the same time. And, and the NBA players were able to get tested immediately. And Sydney was asking to be tested and, and there was, you, you know, tests were not, weren't available. But, uh, she wasn't able to get tested. Um, yeah. I mean, there were, I, I guess the, the, the jazz were tested as, you know, for the potential of being a super spreader, you know, right. a super spreader right. event. And, and so they went about it that way. But no, I guess obviously NBA teams had an easier time being tested than the normal people. And, and obviously WNBA players are considered <laughs> more along the lines of civilians. Um, so maybe NBA players, especially, you know, a reserve guard on the LA Sparks perhaps. But um, yeah, you know, yeah, it just, it just, you know, was a sign of how difficult this problem was going to be. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to the WNBA too, um, but uh, Wes, what's what's been your 2020 moment uh, that stands out? Just to that brought it home to you how how real the pandemic is and and um, how how strange the sports world is going to become here. I think it's probably the the day before everything went down. Um, at Chase Center, we, California is one of the first states, obviously, to issue shelter in place. And 
and um, the Warriors were getting quite a bit of pressure from, you know, the San Francisco uh, government to basically shut down Chase Center, and there was some push and pull there. But I remember the day before, we were talking about um, playing games without fans and how weird that was going to be. That was March 11th, and we had a whole press conference with Bob Myers and Steve Kerr and, and how weird that would be. And then a day later, um, I remember I'm working late at Chase Center because they, they had a practice or whatever. And we were kind of talking about that again, working late on this story. And I'm leaving. And in the hallway, I see this thing about how Rudy Gobert tested positive. And I'm just like, I remember talking to um, the person sitting, uh, walking with me out of the Chase Center. I'm like, this is it. I think the season's going to be over. Like, I think they're going to cancel it. And then within like a few minutes, they had canceled it. And I just remember that exact moment, just being like, how surreal that was from working like for the last 48 hours on just how weird it would be to not play in front of fans to now the whole thing just being gone and, uh, yeah. and canceled. Right. There was just that escalation of one moment after another at that right. time. Uh, Dieter, what do, what do you, rem- what stands out to you among maybe many things? So uh, after Warriors games, Wes and I would often and, and still plan on uh, doing like video standups whenever basketball comes back, whenever we're allowed back in an arena. Um, and I just remember, I mean, this is the thing that stands out most to me and kind of the, the most memorable moment. We all went through sort of the, the uh, development of this together and the craziness of it together. And it was very strange. The Warriors were on a homestand the entire time. And so you're going in and out of this arena. You're wondering if that's a good idea. Um, everybody's a hypochondriac and it's like, it was, mm-hmm. it was absolutely insane, but we're doing this stand up, and there's just people in hazmat suits fumigating the entire arena, just, just spraying it down, you know, for yeah. contagion. Right. And I'm like, I got to get the hell out of here. And uh, sure enough, uh, uh, they did not invite us back after that. But you know, then, then of course, the Rudy Gobert situation, my, my fiance, I remember, said, we have to go out for dinner tonight because this is the last night that you're off and this, this might be it. And while we're at dinner, uh, there's a TV in the corner and I'm kind of keeping my eye on the game and the entire world ended. Tom Hanks got it. The president put in a travel ban and, uh, and Rudy Gobert got it and they shut down the NBA all within an hour. So I'm really glad that we had dinner that night because, uh, she was totally right. And have, have you been out to dinner since? We are allowed to eat outdoors and we yeah. did actually come down to LA for a minute to help my, my grandfather, uh, out for a smidge masks on, of course. And, uh, and there was indoor dining and it was such a surreal experience, even having to wear the mask that, uh, that it's just going to, it's going to last with us for a very long time. Kyle, you and I talk, um, pretty much daily about what life is like in the bubble and, um, how strange that is, but what, you know, b- before you get into your long version of how strange it is, uh, down there. Um, what are a couple things that maybe stand out to you about 2020 so far? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it is actually helpful for me to stick on the bubble because a lot of people, you know, don't have access to here and, and don't know what it's like. I mean, I think the biggest thing that people don't really think about is the bubble is communal and one person's health here ref- is, is critical to everyone else's health here. So um, sort of incidents like what happened with Lou Williams uh, being uh, caught getting getting pickup at a local Atlanta establishment? Um, you know, I mean, it's 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 weird, and I wrote about this because it's not only a news event, but it, I mean, I was interviewing Lou Williams shortly before he left for for this family emergency, which uh, you know was a, a legitimate funeral for a member of his family. Mm-hmm. Um, he he happened to make a mistake after that. Uh, not an unintentional mistake, as Doc Rivers keeps seeming to say. Uh, they should stop using that language because uh, it's it can't be unintentional at this point. But I, I really think that it's just strange as a media member when we take so much you know time and effort to distance ourselves from uh, some of these events that are happening. And so much of 2020 has been, gosh, this is deeply personal because everyone's affected by the pandemic. In the bubble. Um, you know, our safety, I mean, I was interviewing Lou Williams on Wednesday and I was standing, you know, about six feet away from him, but we were in a small room. Um, you know, you, you think about stuff like that and, and it does feel personal and you can't really, uh, the best I can do is acknowledge it because I can't re- really remove myself from it. And that's true of many stories this year, including Kobe Bryant, which I mean, was, it, it was like everyone 
in my world lost a friend, right? right. Um, and that, and that, that's just impossible. Um, it's emotionally exhausting. Um, it's, it's been just the strangest year for so many reasons. LeBron said, you know, nothing is normal in 2020. Um, you just have to adapt. And I think that's what we're all doing. And in some ways as a media member, um, this year is more personal than any year I've had in my career for, for just these reasons of um, y- you can't divorce yourself from it. Right. Right. Yeah. I think we've all felt that here, here in LA with, with Kobe and, and uh, um, but it, uh, you know, everybody trying to get through, through these times um, uh, I think we'll, we'll certainly welcome um, basketball tonight. Kyle, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you can tell, uh, share a couple other, you know, just insider. I mean, you talked about like seeing the uh, referees um, playing games by the pool, right? Um, uh, little quirky things that you're seeing in the bubble. Um, yeah. So I think one thing people don't realize is, you know, there's, there's a television product. Um, what you see on TV, you've seen the players, um, you've seen the coaches, uh, the video screens, but there's so much that goes into that. Um, you know, the biggest thing I heard when the bubble was being created and, and the protocols were being created was from teams being like, with thir- if we only travel 35 people, how are we going to put on games? So there's also the equipment staff. There's also health staff. There's, I mean, an on-site medical team at Disney. Um, there's, there's team attendance, just this army of like college age ball boys and ball women who are just staying here for the summer as temporary employees uh, and, and kind of <laughs> still trying to get a, a hold of where they all came from. Um, they're like summer interns for the bubble. Um, I mean, and like, like I was telling you the other day, Tom, I mean, referees are here um, and one minute they're being screamed at by players on this court. And then another minute I watch them playing pickleball every morning uh, very competitively to stay, stay in shape. So it's just what is reinforced by living here is just the, the infrastructure required to put on NBA games. It's a lot more than, than people might think. I mean, technical people um, and, and camera people and people who are setting up these giant screens and, and testing them, scorekeepers. It's, it's a wild production to kind of see this micro um, environment constructed just to put on basketball. It's very, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's such a manufactured place and uh, temporary and yet very real for everybody who's living in it for several months. Um, so I, I know from my point of view, I really appreciate you being able to just upend your, your life and, and uh, uh, you know, take that trip down there and, and, and embed yourself. Um, it's, it's been enjoyable for me to just hear the, the, the stories you're, you're telling. Um, I wanted to take maybe just a minute to talk about the WNBA too. Um, you know, the, from the hoodies that NBA players were wearing to social justice questions, it feels like to me um, that the WNBA is, has been a leader in, you know, sort of setting an agenda. Um, Miriam, you talk to Sparks players and um, on a pretty regular basis via Zoom. And, and uh, can you talk about what the WNBA means to this, to the moment we're in here? Um, you know, to, to hear them tell that this is, um, you know, just like a moment that's recognizing what they've been doing for several years now. Yeah. In 2016, uh, Tierra Ruffin Pratt, um, when she was with the Mystics, was you know, they, they all wore shirts that said Black Lives Matter and they were fined for it. Um, so that's yeah, no, not very long ago. No, yeah. So now obviously it's on the court and they're wearing Brianna Taylor on the backs of their jerseys. They're not on the court for the national anthem. Um, but, you know, like Candace Parker is, is, is often says that they're a majority minority league in that they're you know, 80% black. And, you know, obviously they're women and um, there's a lot of LGBTQ um, representation with there. So just by their existence alone, they're pretty political. Um, so, yeah, this, I, the, the attention that they're getting is, is in the light that's sort of being shined on their, their efforts is, 
you know, just kind of recognition of what they've been about for, for quite a long time. Do you, do, uh, to the, Kyle, do you see, um, I mean, I, I think we think back to Kobe and the connection he and his daughter had w with the WNBA, but also, um, you know, in the, the NBA in general, I, I mean, I think you, you see more and more recognition of the women's game and how important these athletes are. Is, is that what you're, you're seeing as well? Yeah. And, um, you know, the other day at the scrimmage, uh, LeBron wore uh, one of those orange WNBA hoodies uh, to the game. Dion Waiters was wearing it after the game uh, saying we've got to hold it down for the women, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there's a broader recognition. I mean, some of the, the things that uh, the NBA and the, w the MBPA uh, have done here, uh, including a Sunday conversation with Michelle Obama, um, has also included the WNBA. Um, so I think there's, um, you know, there's always been sort of a bond, um, but I think there is a bit of a stronger uh, bond, especially over these social issues that both um, the, the NBA players and WNBA players are trying to put out there, um, especially when it comes to voting, especially when it comes to Brianna Taylor, um, you know, WNBA, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe had incredible ratings uh, this weekend. And I, I think that was in part, uh, may, maybe they got a little nudge from um, NBA players who were saying, hey, watch this game, watch these players. Um, and Brittany Sykes uh, own athleticism on display uh, for the Sparks this weekend. That's so right. I think there is some um, common Common, uh, common goals there uh, between these leagues and the, that have only been strengthened in the last couple months. Um, I wanted, and maybe we'll, we'll start with Wes and, and Dieter on this question, but, um, uh, and then come back around to Kyle and Miriam. Kyle, you talked a little bit about Kobe Bryant's death. Um, Wes, uh, how did that moment strike you and, um, uh, you know, how did, how did the Bay Area experience, you know, we were so in, embedded in it here in LA. Um, what was that like uh, where you were and to cover the NBA as that happened um, in the Bay Area? Yeah, I remember it's one of those moments where you just, you remember exactly where you were when you heard it. And I was at Chase Center because that's where I spent, you know, 98% of my time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the other reporters was like, did you hear about Kobe? I had just walked into the press room. And I was like, what about Kobe? And obviously they told me, and I was just like, that's not true. There's no way. And then obviously it, it hits you and you realize it. And um, they, the Warriors canceled their availability. They just completely canceled their shoot around or their, their practice that day. So I just remember sitting there and just trying to figure out what to do and what to write. And um, eventually we had a, uh, um, a, a phone conference with Bob Myers, but that was sort of the coverage of it. Um, and then you like, then you just had these like, and, you know, obviously you guys know in Southern California more than anybody, but then you just had the reports coming out after and just like this weight, this unending wave of just more information and more um, reaction and things like that. And the next uh, game that the Warriors played, I believe it was either the next game or the next road game was in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And so we had that trip and I broke away the day before the game and went to Lower Marion High School where Kobe Bryant went to high school just outside of Philly. And that to me was the moment where it really kind of hit uh, where I'm walking to that high school and they have this huge memorial out there um, with just sneak like Kobe Bryant sneakers and posters and just letters to Kobe and the family, just people mourning, crying, um, just like outside that, that memorial. Um, and I, it was again, like one of those moments where you, like Kyle was saying, you kind of, it's hard to divorce yourself from just all the emotion and your own personal feelings about it and the whole thing. And it was, it was emotional for me to see mm -hmm. people just sort of break down right. in front. And so I got, I got some interviews and I did what I needed to do. And then I just, I just hung out for like another hour and a half and just, uh, and just sort of took it all in. And, um, and then I actually remember calling an Uber and getting in that Uber and the guy, my Uber driver ended up making my story because he went to school with Kobe or he went, I'm sorry, he didn't go to school with Kobe, but played for the rival high school. Right. Um, and so uh, I ended up getting that interview. He ended up, I think, making the story. Oh. But uh, it was just a while. Like I, I had my recorder on for, I don't know, 15 minutes. And then we just like 
we just chatted for the next like 30 minutes because that's how far my hotel was. But uh, it was surreal. Yeah. yeah. Dieter, what was, how did you experience that? that it, was, it was, it was, um, I was, I was going to the Super Bowl that week. Huh. Uh, I was literally, I found out uh, at my hometown airport, Midway Airport, South Side of Chicago, um, <laughs> just sitting there. We were, we were just having a beer in between flights. And it was like, I guess I shouldn't announce that. That might be some expense report issues, but uh, like I'm and, making and, note of that. Yeah, yes, I'm yeah. Sure. Don't worry, I, I I got plenty more. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get audited now. But um, yeah, I just I it, you overhear it, and you're like, wait, what? You know, and your phone hasn't adapted to the fact that it went through three time zones and all that, and then you, finally, and just the the steady stream, and we had a flight in, in another, you know, twenty minutes, and so it, it happens. You then have to remove yourself from what, what is clearly a, a zeitgeist moment and this kind of collective understanding of, of you know, something terrible that just happened that, that seemingly affected everybody. Um, and then you go down to the Super Bowl, of all places, in, in Miami, and that was the story of the week. Um, and, and at the same time, you have the, the coronavirus stuff starting to really heat up. I, I just... I remember uh, how strange it felt to be away from the Bay Area, away from California in that moment, because it seemed as if everybody wanted to just kind of get back home. And um, yeah, it really did set off a, a incredibly bizarre, bizarre uh, chain reaction of, of circumstance that is still with us today. But I, I, I very, I very vividly, as, as Wes alluded to, remember. Uh, the uh, the bar at the Midway Airport as we as huh. me and my colleagues were just sitting there waiting for our next flight. Yeah, that's. I think yeah, we'll we'll never forget. You know when we when we all heard about it. Um, my story is that uh, I was helping coach my daughter's basketball team, and uh, you know phones in my pocket, messages are turned off, and it's at halftime that uh, a guy comes out of the stand holding his cell phone and pulls the ref over and the ref announces it to the, to the, the group there. Um, you know, and it had been, you know, a little bit of time. It had been a minute before, um, you know, I realized that we were, had the, the biggest sports story, um, you know, in LA history maybe uh, happening. And um, I remember uh, telling the head coach, Hey, I got to go. And, and uh, you know, saying to my daughter, Hey, I, I got a big story. I got to leave your game. Right. And then, you know, the feeling of that connection between daughters and dads and their, and, and coaches and, and the other girls that were lost. Um, and, and, and then trying to get on the phone with Kyle, uh, who after a long grind, who was, was going to take a couple of days off and, and catch up with his family. Right. Hey, Kyle, you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was going to take some time off, um, and obviously that changed, and I flew back the next day. Um, but uh, to, to kind of advance this, I, I'm, you almost feel like what happened with the pandemic, although it's, it's not beneficial to anybody, um, I'm interested to see how that kind of balances out what the Lakers had already been dealing with, um, with Kobe's death, because even before he died, um, you know, Kobe's shadow loomed so large over this era of Lakers basketball. Um, they had not, re they had not reached the playoffs before this year since he left. Um, and, you know, LeBron is the, is sort of the next star in line, right? I mean, this, this, mm -hmm. this tenure is already this great weight for him. And then Kobe dies in this shocking and, and terrible way. Um, and, I think LeBron was at the fore of it. I think he very much in the locker room helped keep them together. Um, but one thing that struck me at the time was we are going to be talking about Kobe all year and it's going to be hard. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I wrote a couple stories at the time, like basically every time you go to a visiting arena, there's going to be a Kobe tribute video and it's going right. to be a lot of re-exposure to that kind of trauma. Um, and, and hard for these guys, a lot of them who knew Kobe personally, or like in the case of somebody like Quinn Cook, former warrior, um, you know, idolized Kobe was like, this was the player that was on his wall even before he was in the NBA. And then once he was in the NBA, 
he, he could call him. And I, I think now that there's been a break and that now that, you know, it's the season isn't just about playing for Kobe, which it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, LeBron has a finger sleeve with number 24 on it. Right. And, and he, he remembers that very closely. But I, the balance of it is it's not just for Kobe. It's, it's for all of basketball. It's for America, in a sense, right. um, that, that the NBA is back. And I, I think that balance is easier emotionally for this team and a little bit, um, not that, you know, it's the most important thing about Kobe's death, but it, it, it was heavy, right? Yeah. And, well, and I, I think it's going to be better for them in, in the long run. It, in, but that's not the single focus. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But that's not the single focus. I think, I, yeah, I think I remember at the, you know, at one point when LeBron picked up the microphone and said, I'm going to carry it for you. I'll carry the whole thing. Um, and uh, I, I, I still think that's a part of this Lakers story. However, it turns out that, that he took, took on that responsibility or burden or, you know, uh, and it, it'll be interesting, you know, as the playoffs go on to see, you know, where that fits. Miriam, you, I know you did the, um, you did the A1 story from the memorial for us, but what stands out to you um, in, in looking back at that, that time in 2020? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Kyle said, like the, the pause and the thing of the pandemic has given people kind of a time to, to mourn. Um, and that's probably been good. Um, but as far as, yeah, LA, I mean, it just rocked LA to its core. I've never experienced anything like that and can't imagine experiencing anything like that. I mean, just, you know, I, it's, it's heavy just talking about it. I am, I'm the same age as Kobe was. And right. so, and I grew up in Southern California and even when I was in Oregon, you know, I was rocking Kobe jerseys at the University of Oregon, and, like, he was my favorite basketball player. So, um, it, you know, it was, it was hard. And then when you went out to the memorial, which like, you can't even describe unless you were there, it was just it was all of L.A., just every cross-section, every kind of – everybody from young, old, everything from out, you know, in the desert to, to right there in L.A., leaving every piece of memorabilia you could leave, just, you know, tons and tons of it. And it was just quiet and people would, you know, everybody was there and they just mourning together. And I mean, I gave hugs to so many strangers and had <laughs> wow. so many conversations and, and people were crying and I, I cried a little bit and it was, right. it was crazy. Yeah. It was nothing I'll ever forget. Yeah. Well, hugs to strangers is a thing that's a thing that of the past right. too. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, one thing that strikes me and it struck me at the time too was you know we're such a divided country uh so polarized that um i don't think there was anything quite like kobe bryant's death that made us feel like we're all we're all in la in this together um that was and and it'll be interesting to see what you guys think if, if you know just getting back to basketball has some of that element too, especially if we're looking at a, a you know a Lakers or Clippers championship run here. If there's some feel of, you know, we're all in this together. I I mean it's 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 fairly stunning to me that a pandemic can't do that uh, for us. Um, but but do you feel like Kyle um, that that could be an element of of what we're going to see in in NBA basketball or or you know we. we how do you feel about that question? Yeah, um, I, I think it already is. I mean, I think um, here at the bubble, uh, it's been very collegial. Uh, it's been very, um, you know, among the players, they see each other on campus and wave and hang out and, and do stuff together. And, you know, that may sort of change a little bit as, as we get into more intense games and series and things like that. Um, But, I mean, again, the NBA is an ecosystem. The NBA is composed of thousands. um, And there's just people here who are happy to work again and happy Mm -hmm. to – I mean, and I'm not talking about uh, even just people associated with game, but, but, you know, bus drivers here and security guards and and PA announcers and um, all kinds of, I mean, like I described the, the, the team attendants who are these, these college age kids who are, you know, out of school and don't have opportunity to work. Um, and 
that is such a, a powerful force to see um, in in a country where obviously you know we're not doing well, and obviously there's a lot of problems. Um, and I think that that will be um, something that's a little understated of this whole thing that people are back at work um, because of the bubble. Um, but it's it's a definitely a unifying factor here, um, and something that. Uh, a lot of people, when this game tips off tonight, are, are going to feel like that's a victory. Yeah, I do think that's a it, it is, you know, a moment that we've kind of been waiting for. Dieter, what do you do? You have thoughts on 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 um, you know what the return of the NBA means to us as, as sports fans? Well, and obviously, it's, it's yeah, yeah it's, it's great to have um, some level of normalcy back. I mean, how many days of our lives have we spent even outside of just our profession? But the reason that we're in this game is because we love it so much. And, and how many nights have we spent just, okay, it's out here, you know, four or five o'clock, turn on the NBA and watch it until you go to bed. Uh, right. That's that's just the normalcy of it. And uh, being able to just have that back, being in a position now to casually watch sports as opposed to having to do appointment viewing because there's so little of it and you have to make it a, a priority in your day is um, it, it's, it's great. And I, I, I'm been really impressed at least, you know, from 3000 miles away with the presentation that it, it feels very authentic. It doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel, um, eerie at all. We, we've seen with baseball coming back and playing in these empty stadiums, the cardboard cutouts help and the crowd noise helps a little bit, but um, I, I much prefer what they're doing in, in the NBA with, you know, the tight proximity court and uh, very minimalistic look on the court and kind of the scoreboards around it, what they've done with MLS at so the same facility with, you know, just put up some ads. I'll, I'll take some ads. I'll, I'll take some gross commercialization at this point um, of something that's not the coronavirus. So, um, yeah, I, I've, I've just been really impressed with how it's been handled. And we'll see, I mean, as this thing pushes forward, um, it's important to remember, I mean, this league has to get back to playing in arenas at some point. Um, financially, they cannot they cannot reasonably go back to the bubble next year. I know it's been suggested by the Players Association, but we, we got to get to a point where they're able to bring in some gate revenue um, yeah. because the TV contracts can only do so much. So I'm trying to kind of savor it because it does feel like it's just basketball. It's almost the most authentic form of basketball. We don't have to worry about the crowd influencing the refs or, you know, the too loud, you know, the nasty arena stuff going on. Like it's just guys playing. It's a little bit AAU, but um, I think, you know, everyone says, oh, we're going to get nasty risk on this championship I would argue that this is the, the one true championship if we're really calling it everybody's kind of dealing with the exact same environment so uh, really excited to kind of just savor these moments over the next few months because uh, I, I hope fingers crossed they're once in a lifetime yeah well we've got a, a little time left um, for Q&A and I want to remind anybody who's who's still uh, with us out there that if you if you want to ask any questions feel, feel free to type those into the uh, Q and a bar here. Um, got one of them. Uh, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, anonymous, uh, viewer, uh, says, I understand the NBA has invested a lot in technology for the fan experience tonight. Any, um, com comments from the panelists about what we should expect the fan experience is going to be like watching these games from the bubble. Uh, I'll start with Kyle. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, there, it's been tweaking. Um, so since in the three scrimmages that the Lakers have done, well, I've seen more scrimmages, but th they've added in arena crowd noise, which is just kind of weird. It's like a 2K game. Um, it, it's There's a little bit of delay. Um, they've added um, home graphics with, um, you know, with the Lakers. It's like the Laker girls and, you know, various fans from different markets. Um, I've heard that actually uh, they've recorded – uh, calls of Lawrence Tanter, the in-arena announcer for the Lakers, uh, and he's going to do uh, introductions virtually in a, in a way um, huh. and do a couple uh, calls. Uh, to, so that will be there. But, I mean, honestly, this is – they're figuring out now. Like, the, like during the scrimmages, they were doing technical tests uh, involving NBA employees um, in these digital seats. There's about 350. Um, per game. And I think the idea for each team is to uh, go through 
um, season ticket rolls and things like that to, to find these 350 people who can sit sort of like we are in front of their laptop and, and be virtually uh, at the game. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops. I mean, with the Lakers, you could have like, you know, you could have like Jack Nicholson. Or I was going to say Jack got to uh, make an appearance, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you could do stuff like that. I mean, if you're creative enough, if, if the Lakers get there, we'll find out. Um, yeah. But I, I think it is going to be interesting. I think it's also going to be maybe perhaps infuriating at times because everything is on the fly. I mean, I, I asked somebody the other day, yesterday from the NBA, uh, you know, is this piped in crowd noise in the arena going to stay? And they're like, well, I think so, but I don't know because that's a lot of the answers to the questions. It, it's starting to look like that, but I don't actually know. No one really knows what the best way to do this is. And I think sort of to Dieter's point, um, what's going to carry this is the basketball. And if the players can bring energy and if benches can bring energy, I mean, that's so much more important. I mean, when the Clippers were playing um, the other night, they had more coaches on the bench than reserve players and that actually really mattered in a game I mean they were so quiet in the game and and those things actually really matter in that environment and I think people will kind of come to appreciate that as time goes on Miriam is uh, I feel like the Clippers had uh, something up their sleeves that they were going to announce today too um, well, they've, they've got a series of things they're working on. Um, one of them is an interactive post-game show. I think they're doing it pre-game today, and then going forward, it will be post-game um, on their Facebook page. They've launched a new Facebook page, and like uh, the radio guy and Corey Maggetti and a few others will be involved, and you can kind of ask them questions. It's kind of, kind of like this, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then also, like, they have what Kyle, you know, what you guys are going to see, um, something called Support the Squad, where they've invited season ticket holders to kind of record reactions to like if someone scores and someone there's a get get that out of here omg like you're supposed to record these reactions you have and i guess they're going to put them in a program and deliver them to the nba and the nba will broadcast that some you know in the arena somehow the the appropriate time that that, uh, you can see that yeah yeah Yeah. Um, so that well it, it remains to see be seen how exactly that looks. Um, and even I think the Clippers, you know, they've got lots of ideas going, um, but they're also sort of in a wait and see mode too. So um, it's all gonna be pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I think it, what is also interesting, you know, the, the one way everybody will experience basketball <clears throat> is through TV. Nobody's going to, the, going to these games anymore. And it'll be interesting to see, I, I think, on social media and, you know, how people connect with each other to, you know, experience the, the return of the NBA together as, with other fans and, you know, where that's happening and where that, the best experience is as, as they're watching too. Um, I think we're getting uh, fairly close to the end of this, our, our hour here. Uh, there's tons more we could talk about, but uh, I'm going to give each, um, each writer a minute to wrap up with, with you know, just some final thoughts before we uh, get out and, and, and write about basketball. Uh, we'll start with uh, Wes. Well, I think kind of leading up to this NBA bubble here, there's a lot of questions about whether or not this would be good for everybody as like, you know, as the country trying to figure out the coronavirus pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's going on. But, um, I think what's been sort of staggering to me watching the bubble so far is how much like it it's normal because it's basketball, but it's very abnormal because of the way that the production is because of the the fact that the, the players are so outspoken about this cultural movement and stuff that I think it does. It has served as a reminder and the competition has also been really good. Like in scrimmages, you've got like LeBron James and James Harden, Luka Doncic complaining about foul calls and stuff. So the, like the urgency just seems to be there. Mm -hmm. um so much that i think it's it's gonna end up being a positive experience and maybe it's just a way where yeah you're able to bring people together but you also have people potentially um going out less or or you know finding ways to get in trouble uh or ways to not socially distance because maybe at the end of your night you can just sit down and watch nba basketball for the first time and you have something to do for the first time in a long time so um yeah i've been really impressed with the product so far Dieter, your, your final thoughts uh, 
I, I well, just got to say, we Ted, anything off. Yeah. Um, when we when we have all of these, you know, fans on the, I just don't like this episode of Black Mirror. I just think that it's it's way too much. It's, too, it's no. Um, they're doing an excellent job. I, I've been very critical of Adam Silver and his leadership over the huh. years. Um, uh, I thought that it required the NBA players to essentially get this thing together. That he was dragging his feet. And that it, until the players got together on a Zoom call like this and basically realized, you know, came to the conclusion, uh, well, half of this is our money, so we're going to want to get that. Uh, nothing really developed. But I, I got I to gotta tip my hat. Uh, it, it helps that Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, is doing such a bad job that it's lowered Relatively the bar significantly. Speaking, yeah. yeah. But uh, the NBA now, I, I, I couldn't tell you how many cycles of tests, but the bubble seems to be – uh, working stupendously uh, as well as expected. Yes, they're figuring out stuff on the fly. That That's life in 2020. That's life in general, but we're really feeling it now. Yeah. Um, the leadership of the NBA ha- has really handled this well, and um, I-, I think that it bodes extremely well for this thing moving forward. So, um, Kyle, and you guys can provide far more perspective on, on, what, on how well the bubble's working or not. Maybe I'm just naive in this, but from the outside perspective, uh, they've done a really good job in, in making this, as Wes alluded to, to feel really authentic and straightforward and at, at the same time, you know, being extremely safe, which is very difficult to do in this day and age. Right. Miriam, you ha- do you have some final thoughts for us before we, uh, we see Clippers sure. and I, Lakers in action tonight? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see how it all plays out. Obviously. Um, I, I, you know, Doc, Doc Rivers said that, you know, like, well, you know, there's, there's no asterisk on this, that there should be a, a gold golden star and, Candace Parker over in the WNBA bubble, so there should be an exclamation point, not an asterisk. But I think they're right because this is this has to be the hardest. I mean, the playoffs are so intense and so difficult anyway, normally, and then you do it here, cut off from the whole world, you know, in this intense environment with all that's going on, and whoever comes out on top, I mean, what what fortitude they have, and it really should be celebrated. And it's gonna be really fascinating to see which which group of people man- manages to pull that off. Uh, it, it's going to be quite an unfolding story here as, as we get going. Kyle, there was one thing I think in your newsletter, which, you know, if, if anybody is not su- signed up for Kyle Goon's newsletter, uh, click on the Orange County Register site and um, uh, go to the newsletters and, and sign, do yourself a favor and sign up because um, he's got a lot of inside perspective on, on what's going on throughout there. There's only 10 reporters, 10 or is it maybe a dozen. Uh, nationally who are allowed to see and have the access Kyle does inside. Um, so it's worth, worth signing up. But I think one thing you sort of concluded today's newsletter with was, um, you know, just comparing the people on the outside watching from the inside. And I think you, the way you put it was something about the people on the inside are all rooting for the people on the outside right now as well. Um, um, can, what, are, what are your final thoughts before we um, yeah. um, well, well, one, close actually, this up? So before that, uh, I, I want to say something that I've tried to say on every media. I've tried to write this. Um, you know, the work of the bubble is not done until the bubble's over. Um, and, you know, the NBA and MPPA uh, had another announcement yesterday where they announced there were zero positive corona, uh, coronavirus cases uh, again, uh, among players in the bubble, which is great. Like that's how it's supposed to work, but it's just not over until it's over. And, and there's right. going to be people coming in and player guests coming in and literally hundreds of people are going to turn over in the bubble. And every one of them, um, you know, has to follow the protocols, follow the rules, get tested and all those things. So it's, it's never over. This is the starting line. This is not the finish line of creating the bubble. And the other thing is, yeah, I mean, it's just a weird feeling to every day wake up and, and read different headlines and sort of, and I think players are feeling that too, um, which is why you're seeing a lot of them uh, really kind of keep the dialogue going uh, for, for these social justice causes. Uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, what LeBron James and other folks are doing uh, in the realm of voting rights with more than a vote. Um, all these initiatives that are kind of being powered. I mean, the NBA announced yesterday they're doing community testing program in Florida and other places for um, communities uh, of color that have been, you know, disproportionately affected by coronavirus. So these things are still ongoing. And even though we're in the bubble, um, the outside world is on our minds because when this is over, that's where we return, right? I mean, we all 
have families to go back to, friends to go back to. So, um, you know, it is, you know, it's been encouraging to see the NBA kind of build this infrastructure and, and think it out and, and execute it as well as they have so far. But, um, you know, we're hoping for the same thing on the outside, myself included. I mean, that's a personal thing too, because yeah. uh, we all want to see a safer world to come back to uh, when this is over and a champion is crowned. All right. Well, thank you everybody for, for your time, uh, for the writers, um, for being here. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I, I feel like it, so much going on with the NBA that we could, we could do this for, um, you know, another hour uh, with, without any trouble. Um, but, uh, and, and thank you for, for those of you who tuned in. Um, appreciate you listening and, and um, especially for you subscribing and, and reading the, the work that we're doing. Um, so uh, to all of you, uh, I'm going to, uh, again, thanks and, and be safe out there. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to Aaron, uh, and wrap it up. Perfect. Thanks, Tom. Thank you guys all for, for your insight. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation we had here today. Uh, we have recorded it and we'll be sending it out in the next few days. Um, so don't worry about that. And then also just a quick reminder for our final uh, episode. It is next week and it is going to be our NFL episode. So please go ahead and register for that. If you do have any other questions, um, you're more than welcome to email us at the events at bayareanewsgroup.com or for our Southern California folks at events at scng.com. So please go ahead and let us know any uh, comments, questions you may have. Um, and then please sign up for our next webinar. Thank you guys again. I appreciate all your time. Uh, enjoy your Thursday afternoon and, and enjoy the first game of, of the season, I guess. Uh, so enjoy and thank you guys.